Mbappe campaign in the vote and that it would be irrelevant to uh, these proceedings. What is the relevance of this? Voice? Uh, the relevance, Your Honor, and, and when I offered it, I made clear that it was a 2009 video. And the significance of it is that um, even after the campaign for Proposition 8 was over with, there continued to be this campaign against um, uh, gay people, uh, this campaign uh, portraying gay people as a threat. Um, this is part of the a pattern of discrimination uh, that we've referred to. And I think it is relevant to Mr. Katami's state of mind and the state of mind of other people that they're subject to this kind of um, uh, attacks. Uh, now, in, in some cases, this may be even more relevant than the campaign videos. I mean, in the campaign videos, they have the excuse that they were preparing these things because they were in the middle of a political campaign. Um, this is something that is prepared, it is, it is distributed after the campaign is over with, uh, and it, it can have uh, no function, as, as, I, as I think the court will see when it, when it sees the video, other than to uh, try to demonize um, gay people, to try to infer that somehow uh, gay people uh, have some kind of agenda that is a threat to society. And you link this to the parties here. Uh, Your Honor, could I have a moment on that? Okay. Your Honor, I believe that this will dem I think it actually shows on the video that it was produced by the National, uh, National Organization for Marriage, I think, the, f the formal name is which was one of the largest supporters of, of Proposition 8. Um, the, um, uh, the defendants, you know, try to draw a distinction between what they call the official campaign and the unofficial campaign. Um, in fact, it's all one campaign, and the attempt to sort of step back uh, for purposes of, of this litigation and pretend it there was only a really official campaign and they didn't know anything about or have any knowledge of what was going on with, with everybody else, uh, I think is not credible, particularly when you're talking about an organization uh, like the National Organization for Marriage um, that was one of their primary funders. So um, uh, I, I believe that this is sufficiently related uh, to the campaign broadly defined. I also think that regardless of whether it is linked to the campaign, even if this were simply something that had come up from somebody who had no connection with the campaign, um, uh, it, is, um, uh, it is relevant to the kinds of issues that the court is going to consider in terms of the appropriate standard of whether it's strict scrutiny or rational basis or somewhere in between uh, as to whether this is a class of people that is subject to continuing um, discrimination. Your Honor, number one, this was not produced by protectmarriage.com, and protectmarriage.com is not a national organization for marriage. Number two, it was after, months after the uh, Prop 8 campaign, campaign. Number three, the ad itself doesn't even reference Prop 8 or California. For all of those reasons, including the fact that Mr. Katami has been identified to testify solely about sexual orientation and the harms that he suffered at a res as a result of Prop 8. Any harm that could have flowed from this particular video is not as a result of Prop 8. I'm inclined to think that the connection to uh, the parties at suit here and uh, the issues is sufficiently tenuous that uh, there would not be a basis for admitting Exhibit 350. Uh, you're proposing to admit it, Mr. Boyce, for purposes of showing uh, uh, an atmosphere or public attitude of homophobia. Uh, I think there are other ways of establishing that and uh, this particular exhibit, given the lack of connection to the parties at suit, uh, I don't believe is uh, appropriate for admission. Therefore, the objection will be sustained. Your Honor, um, 
uh, let me then offer uh, Plaintiff's Exhibit 1, which is the uh, voter information guide uh, for uh, Proposition 8. Uh, and this also is one that I have now checked, uh, was uh, identified uh, on a timely basis. While you're identifying exhibits, did you move in 99 and 401? Uh, yes, Your Honor, we did. Not clear whether those were simply marked or simply uh, moved for admission. And offer those for. Uh, All right. Admissions. And let's see, um, 401 will be admitted subject to the qualification that I outlined, namely that the witness must be available for at least 48 hours in the event that uh, proponents wish to examine him with reference to Exhibit 401. So 99 and 40, 401 will be admitted. <clears throat> Now you're moving to Exhibit 1, and can that be placed before the witness? May I approach, Your Honor? Yes, you may. Mr. Katami, do you recognize this exhibit? I do. And what is it? It is the California Voter Information Guide for 2008. And uh, did you uh, review this in 2008? Yes, Jeff and I have a habit of reviewing <laughs> these before elections. Uh, Your Honor, I would offer Exhibit 1. Very well, Exhibit 1 will be admitted. Um, let me um, ask you to turn to page that is numbered in the bottom right-hand corner, 3365. And if we could put that up on the screen. And in particular, I'd like to direct your attention in the argument in favor of Proposition 8. Do you see that? I do. Top of the page. And it's two columns. And in the right-hand column, um, the um, next to the last paragraph, do you see that? Did you say the next to the last paragraph? Next to the last paragraph. Yes. It says, voting yes on Proposition 8 restores the definition of marriage that was approved by over 61% of the voters. Voting yes overturns the decision of four activist just judges. Voting yes protects our children. You see that? I do. And um, what was the um, reaction that you had uh, to that argument? Well, once again, it always seems to be the punchline of the message. Regardless of what Jeff and I are informed voters, we do the reading, we discuss it, and when there are facts of merit, we're open to hearing them. We discuss them. But this punchline again of protecting children, it is absolutely clear that because you see this recurring theme of protecting children, and I go back to what do you protect children from? You protect them from harms that we put upon them. We are not a harm. So then that leads me to believe, how does this generate? How does someone even think of putting protect your children in here? That language is indicative of some kind of perpetration against a child which leads me to believe that there is definitely, it, well, it's discriminatory. It absolutely puts me into a category that I do not belong in. It separates me from the norm. It makes me into someone, a part of a community that is perpetrating some sort of threat. And that's not who we are or what we're here about. Um, so I, I disagree with it wholeheartedly. I think it's um, unfair. 
and I don't think it represents the situation. Uh, Mr. Zerillo uh, testified that the two of you had decided not to register as domestic partners. Um, uh, I'd like to ask you uh, to tell the court your reasoning for uh, choosing not to register with the state of California as domestic partners. We hear a lot of what's the big deal. Get most of the same rights, virtually all the same rights. What's the big deal? The big deal is, and we've discussed this, the big deal is it's creating a separate category for us. And that's a major deal because it makes you into a second, third, and as Mr. Olson said today, a fourth class citizen now that we actually recognize marriages from other states. And everyone says, oh, but that's a huge stride. You get rights. But we still have discrimination. So it's like, for lack of a better image, it's putting a Twinkie at the end of a treadmill and then saying, here's a bite. Here's another bite. Well, you want that Twinkie. <laughs> I mean, you want the whole thing. And I know it's a rudimentary example of what it is, but that's how it is. It is not the same. Oh, but you say same, same rights. Yeah, but what am I supposed to do? Go have a domestic partnership ceremony and then a reception? I mean, it's not what you do. Um, none, of our, none of our friends have ever said, hey, this is my domestic partner. By allowing us full access to those rights, not even the rights as much as it is the identity of being married, the full access to being a full participant as a citizen of our country and our state, that's denied. And when your state sanctions something that segregates you, it fortifies people's biases, in my opinion. It gives them an excuse to say, well, it's not right. You don't deserve it because the state tells us that. And to me, that's fundamentally wrong. It's rooted in something that's fundamentally wrong because all I'm desiring, <coughs> all I want is to be married. And that affects no one except for my husband, my family, my friends, our concentric circles. And you know what? If it bolsters our profile in our society, in our world, then good. So be it. Because as long as that we are sanctioned by our state to be told that we're different, regardless of how proud we want to be, regardless of how happy we are in our pursuits, we're still lacking. And to me, that's absolutely un-American. We're not a country about us and them. We're supposed to be at a country about us, all of us, working in concert, doing things together. That's why we have these protections. My state is supposed to protect me. It's not supposed to discriminate against me. And I have no more questions. Very well, and cross-examine. Well, that's a good idea. <laughs> All right, why don't we uh, then take our lunch and recess until 1.30 this afternoon, and we'll resume with cross-examination of this witness.